Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session on pioneering our understanding of the human brain. I'd like to introduce Dr. Samir Shah. Dr. Shah is an MD PhD and Associate Professor of Neurosurgery, Vice Chair of Clinical Research, and Director of Psychiatric Neurosurgery in the Department of Neurosurgery at Baylor College of Medicine. He will be presenting in our Brain Initiatives Scientific Updates track on mechanisms of rapid, flexible cognitive control in human prefrontal cortex. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashanian, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lapperts. We also would like to extend our special thanks to the program directors of the Brain Initiative, and in particular, Dr. James Nat, for all their efforts in organizing today's session. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We therefore encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. We will also offer a unique opportunity to directly address awardees of the Research on Humans Division of the Brain Initiative. This live panel Q&A will take place following this presentation today at 9 p.m. at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Any questions that we don't have time to address to our speaker will be answered via email following the presentation. Dr. Shea's presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Samir Shah. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank um, Jim Nat uh, from NIH uh, Brain Initiative, ROH, uh, as well as uh, Roa Hashemiun at, at LabRoots for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, as well as the rest of the team uh, at Brain uh, ROH uh, at the NIH in general. Uh, so uh, my talk is uh, on mecha uh, mechanisms of rapid, flexible cognitive control in human prefrontal cortex, and this is a U01 grant um, through the Brain Initiative uh, ROH project. And, uh, you know, as is exemplified by ROH in general, the idea here is really to use the opportunities we have in clinical neurosurgery, for example, to uh, directly record from the brain and ask some really uh, interesting questions about some of the uh, uh, very complex uh, functions that our brains perform. So to start off with, I want to, uh, of course, start with my thanks. And um, the the teams are shown here that are part of this project. So the Baylor team is uh, myself and my two uh, collaborators in the uh, DBS program here, uh, Ashwin Wiswanathan and Juhi Manishahed. The other clinical site where the data are recorded are Columbia University, uh, shown on the side here, uh, with Nora Venegas, Guy McCann, and Charlie Schroeder. And the engineering group there, uh, Dion Cordigali and Jennifer Galinas, um, uh, are also very uh, critical for the reporting uh, approaches that I'll talk about uh, and I'll name as we go. Uh, also collaborators at the University of Houston, Nuri Inche, and at Google DeepMind for all the uh, deep analytics with Matt Botnick and Jeb uh, Zeb uh, Kurt Nelson. So, the, as I said, the ROH in general has given us the ability and really encouraged us to examine some of the very amazing things that our, our brains are able to do. And uh, one of these very interesting complex abilities is the subject of, of this particular project that, that we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. Um, and the, the general idea is that, you know, in our, in our daily lives, we often find ourselves in situations that we've never previously faced. And yet we have to be able to respond to them appropriately, uh, meet the unique demands that they are uh, exacting on us, and respond appropriately and, and correctly on the first try. We don't get to kind of rehearse this and, and try it over and over again oftentimes. And you know, there's, there's simple examples of this, like you know, this, uh, traffic on your way home and you have to take a different route that you haven't tried before. But then they're also much more complex and sometimes um, uh, very demanding situations. And again, we have to really uh, use either instructions or previous experience to do the right thing uh, on the first try. Uh, the, our brains have developed this ability to rapidly assemble structured uh, contingent programs of behavior. And I'll define that uh, term program in a little bit. Uh, and to do so in an immediate ad hoc fashion, meaning kind of uh, dynamically and, and online. 
And so the goal of this project really is to understand the neurophysiological and computational basis of this uh, very amazing c capacity that we have called ad hoc self-programming. So that's kind of the, um, the, the goal of this project. So what do I mean by this uh, ad hoc self-programming? Uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, if I asked you to raise your hand every time I said the word minion, uh, you know, you've never done this before, but you could probably do it correctly uh, on your first try because you can make the appropriate associations. You know how to recognize the word minion. You know how to raise your hand. You know how to connect those two things uh, with a if-then kind of statement. And so you can do this right away, even though you've never done it before, uh, through the instructions and through the tools that you already have uh, accumulated. Uh, a more complicated example is if you were to get on a flight and land in Heathrow Airport and rent a car and decide to drive to see Big Ben. Um, you know, you've never done this before. You've never driven in London or the UK. Uh, you've never rented this particular model of car before, you used this particular gear shift assembly. You've never driven the steering wheel on this side of the car and you know, on the left side of the road. But chances are you could successfully do that, uh, again, using past experience and cobbling together the, uh, the, uh, the stimulus you know, response relationships that you already know of from driving on the other side of the road uh, and be able to navigate this successfully without uh, getting into a wreck and having to try this 100 times in order to get it right. Uh, you could also you know, take in inputs that you haven't taken in, in before, for example, complicated road signs, and understand them, interpret them, and execute them correctly. So this ability is really one that um, maybe not to be too controversial, maybe we, we're not unique as a species in doing this. There may be some uh, other non-human primate uh, species that do this to some degree, but I think it's incontrovertible that we as humans really do this all the time very well, and it's kind of part of our uh, daily life navigation to be able to do this successfully. So if we break this down a bit, the uh, mental plan, perhaps, uh, for, for navigating these novel situations con contains three features. Uh, one is a concatenation of elementary stimulus response units. So for example, um, you know, when you hear a particular word, you do a particular action. Minion equals raise hand. Uh, you, you then string them together with the branching logic, such as you know, if A, then B, but if not, C, then D. Uh, and we also use prior knowledge or instruction. So, for example, we know what a, a clutch is. We know what an accelerator to brake are, and we can map that onto a, a new um, situation to to do it correctly. Um, so these are these are ad hoc uh, self programs in the sense that they can be cobbled together uh, intuitively, rapidly uh, for for a momentary purpose at that time, and then subsequently discarded if we don't need them again. And then a new one can be assembled in the same manner. And this really allows us to respond adaptively to a large set of circumstances that we face in our lives uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this really is uh, a type of learning or a type of uh, planning that is in contrast to trial and error learning, uh, in, in which case there are programs of action that are, that are incrementally sculpted. Uh, and we use feedback to guide our future deviations from previous responses. Uh, so this is really not the way that we can do something like driving in London. It's not a, a trial and error kind of behavior. Uh, so these these are you know, inappropriate and unsafe in situations uh, that we frequently face. Um, there are perhaps many parts of the brain that are involved in this task uh, and this ability. Uh, the uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is one that is likely heavily involved, and I'll give some examples of why this is the case. Uh, so this was the this is the area of focus of, of this project. So the DLPFC uh, does a lot of uh, important things that are probably related to this type of activity. So uh, a, a few examples of these. Um, old studies, lesion studies, this, is, this one is from half a, uh, half a century ago, from the 1960s, have shown that lesions in the DLPFC um, in humans produce this specific deficit in the ability to execute a task from instructions, even though you can comprehend the task and you can even uh, remember and recite the, the task rules. So this is, this is one example of uh, many different lesion studies, and the highlighted portion of the abstract there shows that, uh, again, in this study of uh, several uh, patients with naturally occurring lesions, only the frontal lobe and the prefrontal lesions affected the ability to follow test instructions. So memory was not a problem, but following the instructional set was really the deficit uh, from this part of the brain being lesioned. Also, uh, a bunch of uh, functional studies, uh, fMRI and MEG studies, have shown that Activation of this area occurs during execution of novel tasks. This is just one of many examples uh, with uh, an fMRI 
uh, analysis shown on the, on the left uh, and the MEG on the right. Uh, the fMRI shows that uh, novel tasks activate this area of the brain more than other parts of the brain and more than uh, tasks that are practiced and rehearsed. Um, the MEG study on the right, uh, again, shows that uh, through Granger causality analysis that the DLPFC really does, uh, uh, you know, lead or, or, or uh, 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 cause activity to follow a certain pattern between DLPFC and other brain regions, and it really does originate from this part of the brain. Uh, and this is, uh, again, in contrast to other studies in, in non-human subjects where uh, most of them are rehearsed and planned and overtrained, and presumably... Uh, different areas of the brain are, are being activated uh, in different ways when this is the case, as opposed to the uh, zero-shot learning or the self-programming that we're talking about in the study. And so finally, some work that we've done ourselves um, has also shown that this part of the brain, the DLPFC, uh, in its uh, neural activity really instantiates the computations underlying the encoding of rules. And so this was a study done in, in human patients undergoing uh, deep brain stimulation surgery where we recorded from a single neurons in the DLPFC uh, in a simple task where they saw pictures of tools like uh, a hammer and a wrench and, and objects that a tool would act on like uh, a nail or a, a nut. And they had to intuitively figure out the rule of the task because the, uh, the, they were shown two pictures and had to figure out whether the two items were similar pictures of the same item, you know, two wrenches, or whether they had a different relationship where there's a tool that could act on an object like a wrench on a nut or a, a hammer on a nail. And so they weren't told which rule to use, but they had to intuitively figure out which rule to use and then decide whether there was a match or non-match. Interestingly, these DLPFC neurons didn't care so much about the match versus non-match, but really were activated when the subject had to figure out which, which, um, which rule to implement, the, the act on rule or the uh, is it similar rule. So a lot of uh, lines of, uh, of evidence suggesting that this part of the brain is probably involved in, in the type of uh, ad hoc self-programming that we're interested in. So uh, now we can also use new opportunities for large-scale neural recordings to uh, really dive into the, uh, the wealth and, and richness of the data that our uh, DLPFC uh, likely uh, houses. So this is um, an opportunity afforded by uh, new recording capabilities uh, that have been developed by uh, Dion Corovelli, who's an engineer at uh, Columbia University now. This is work that he did when he was uh, at NYU, uh, along with uh, uh, Jennifer Galinas, who was also at NYU and is now currently uh, also at Columbia. Uh, so this is a recording array they call the NeuroGrid. This was published a few years ago in Nature Neuroscience. It's an organic material-based array. It's ultra-thin film, so the thickness is on the order of uh, four uh, microns, um, so think like a, a thin you know, piece of cellophane, basically. It's conformable. It can sit on the peel surface and just conform to all of the um, uh, valleys and grooves of, of the peel surface or the sulci, and it's non-penetrating as opposed to, for example, a Utah array, which may, may allow you to record from several neurons simultaneously but is a penetrating array and has you know, those drawbacks. So shown in the figure here is some work that they did initially uh, in animals and mice using this array and showing that they can record uh, single units uh, even through this non-penetrating uh, surface thin film-based approach. You can see the spikes in the, the lower uh, figure. Uh, this has also been done in humans to a, a certain degree uh, that, uh, through work that they had done, and this is what we're going to be incorporating in this project. So to do so, we'll be recording from the human DLPFC, and we're using the opportunity from uh, very standard deep brain stimulation uh, procedures for tremor or Parkinson's, et cetera. And so for these procedures, the, the OR turns into a laboratory, as shown here. There's a patient undergoing a DBS procedure. We set up a, uh, a screen in front of them. Uh, they have a button box or joystick near their hand, and this is the recording device that you see here. And this is a, the, the surgeon's view of the small incision, the small burr hole, and the whole procedure happens through this opening. And so this gives us a, literally a small window on the brain um, uh, from which we can record. Now, uh, we've shown previously, uh, again, in that um, study I showed you earlier with the hammers and, and nails, um, that it, it turns out that the recording sites, or the, the burr holes through which the surgery occurs for these DBS procedures, is typically always over DLPFC, area, area 9, kind of spanning either bank of the uh, superfrontal sulcus, uh, well ahead of the frontal eye field is basically in area 9. So the red uh, circles in that middle figure show the recording sites from this particular study uh, with a CT scan superposed on an MRI showing that indeed we're in area nine. These are the uh, areas that we record from routinely uh, in these uh, clinical procedures. 
Um, and then the raster on the right just shows that we can um, isolate single neurons. Now, this particular study was done with uh, clinical microelectrodes as shown in the left part of the figure, um, where before we inserted the guide tube to the cannulas through the cortex, we just hovered above the cortex and allowed the microelectrode to uh, record from uh, the neurons in the, in the cortical gray matter. Uh, this was fine for that project, but it, it really is slow going. Uh, any uh, particular day, you may get one or two or three neurons on a, on a good day. And so uh, it takes a while to accumulate enough neurons to really build a story. So what we're going to be doing, uh, as you may have predicted, is, is using that neurogrid array it, during this uh, DPS procedure in order to record from spores or hopefully hundreds of neurons uh, from the cortical surface in DLPFC. Uh, and this is some uh, preliminary figures showing that uh, we are indeed able to do this. Uh, and uh, Dion has uh, manufactured a, a neurogrid array, uh, as shown on the bottom left, that is the uh, uh, correct form factor uh, for recording through a uh, standard DBS burr hole. And on the bottom right, you see some data where we have micro LFP recorded, and even uh, in panel D of that figure, we, you know, we see some uh, spiking activity, and we can do some, uh, some simple phase alignment. So micro LFP and likely uh, single unit activity should be obtainable uh, through this type of array. The behavioral task uh, that we're going to ask the patients to perform is a novel task that we have developed in collaboration with uh, a group at uh, DeepMind, um, uh, Matt Botvinnik and, and Zed uh, Kurt Nelson. And so the idea is that we want to have a task where the subject is doing something different on every trial. So they really are doing uh, a different task uh, so that there's no possibility of overtraining or of uh, you know, a trial and error type of learning. So we've designed the task that we call the birds game. Uh, they see uh, a bird of a particular color. These are the four colors that they're shown, and they're given an instruction that tells them when to push a button, uh, basically you know, when to take a photograph of a bird. And so they may have an instruction that says something like this. Uh, press the button for all red birds until you see two blue birds in a row, after which press only for green birds. So as they're reading, they have to understand this and encode this and understand what they have to do. And then the trial starts, and so you see a green bird. No, don't press it because they're thinking I need to look for a red bird. And so they see a red bird and they say, yes, I'm going to press the button because I'm supposed to press for red until I see two blue. So then I see one blue. All right, I'm still uh, in the same state I was before, two blue. Okay, so I've seen two blue birds now. Now I'm in a different state. I'm going to change my rule. and Now I'm looking for a green bird. So for red, I'm not pushing. For green, I am pushing, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is the uh, one example of a trial, and there would be uh, several of these trials that are presented to the subject. Uh, here's another example. Uh, press the button every time you see uh, the sequence blue, then green, then red. So that's another type of rule that they would see, and they have to execute that trial correctly. <clears throat> um, these these programs can can be diagrammed in these uh, these uh, state space models, basically. Where, uh, for example, that first rule I, I showed you is um, is program two on this list. And the bottom, uh, the second rule I showed you is the is the bottom rule of program three. So there are three canonical program structures, and if we change all of the <clears throat> uh, the variables the different colors, uh, then we can really have unique trials every time. But there is some program structure that we can look for in coding in terms of the neural data. <clears throat> so uh, it's a complex task, but I'll show you in the preliminary data that subjects should be able to perform it, uh, and it'll provide a very rich data set to do some very um, interesting analytics. So what are those analyses? I'll just talk briefly about uh, some examples of these. Um, as you can imagine, the, the data will be very rich. Every trial uh, will have a, a whole, um, several different epochs of, of interest, in, including the encoding of the actual verbal rule that the subject reads at the, at the time of the reading, uh, as well as the, at the execution. And that um, pattern of activity we expect will change over the course of the trial because uh, the, the rule that is uh, appropriate is going to change over the course of the trial, depending upon what they see and how that rule changes over the course of the instruction. So again, with uh, the collaborators at DeepMind, with, with Matt and Zeb's help, uh, we have a, a plan of how to tackle this uh, complex analysis. And we'll start with some simpler models and progress to more complicated ones. So the, the initial ones that we'll use are a seek-to-seek -seek, um, recurrent neural network type of framework. Uh, very uh, typical sort of uh, um, approach to these kinds of problems where uh, you have uh, input data. Uh, in this case, um, or in the case of example shown in the figure, uh, the input data are uh, various different words. So, you know, how are you? Um, so these, uh, these, these quanta of information are being uh, 
uh, encoded within the RNN, uh, and then through uh, lots of uh, uh, exposure to learning, uh, they can recurrently come up with an optimized response pattern, which is shown in the yellow boxes, um, and, and emit the appropriate response. In this case, I am fine. So for the purposes of, uh, of this project, we're going to use this framework to study these program embeddings. So I showed you those three different programs, uh, canonical program structures for the task. So the inputs the, to the encoder, uh, in the case of our task, would be the word-by-word -word instructions, for example, uh, of each program, which would be different uh, for, for every program. Uh, and so the the RNN would first be trained on a huge uh, set of programs, and then uh, for each individual program that's that's executed, uh, each instruction word by word is going to be the, the input, the encoder, and then the output would be the appropriate response, which is to press or not to press the button. So this is one example of the type of analytics that we can use. Um, a more complicated one would be this one, the differentiable neural computer, which is also developed by DeepMind and published a few years ago where it's essentially an RNN, but with the addition of a memory buffer, like a, like a RAM for a computer. So it has the uh, capability of the RNN in terms of <clears throat> having uh, a training set that it can be optimized on, but also memory structures within which to manipulate the data. So just a little bit on, uh, a little bit on the uh, preliminary data we have so far. There's four epilepsy patients uh, with intracranial electrodes that are not the same test bed as the DBS patients that we're talking about for this project, but you know some interesting data that we've collected so far that gives us optimism that this kind of approach will work. The behavior shows that they're indeed able to uh, perform appropriately. And just a very quick analysis of the ERP so that the DLPFC is from the top left here really does care about this type of uh, task and each bird by bird uh, response. And then on the right is shown um, the uh, a very simple support, support vector machine analysis showing that we can indeed decode the information just from the LFP in this case, uh, recorded DLPFC which again gives us optimism that this type of approach will work. So in the next uh, couple of years, we're gonna be executing the rest of the project using the recording opportunities I discussed and the analysis that I discussed. So I'm very excited about this and thanks for the opportunity. And again, thanks to NIH uh, and LabRoots. Thank you, Dr. Shack, for that very informative presentation. As a reminder, our speaker will follow up with any specific questions about his presentation via email. Coming up next, join us for a unique opportunity to directly address awardees from the Research on Humans Division of the Brain Initiative. We now have our live Q&A session following. Looking forward to seeing you there.